You guys feeling all right? Yeah? Are you forcing that smile? Are you forcing that response? And I mean, that's the go-to. I'm, I'm doing good. I'm fine. Everybody say, I'm fine. No, you're not. Don't lie to me. Something's going on. Something's going on beneath the surface. Always, because you are human and you go through the human experience. So I am excited for this brand new series. We're going to get into a lot of details on this. But first, just as a reminder, we are a church that exists to equip every generation to reach the relational world for Christ. You'll see in your bulletin that uh, we believe God's given us a specific vision and specific faith goals to work uh, for, which is growing this church, about 600 people. And as I speak right now, we have a brand new Spanish language service that is going on and our classic worship center, which I'm very excited about. And uh, we want to be about not keeping the love of Christ to ourselves. We want to be a conduit, not like a black hole. We want to share the love of Christ with our community. That's why we inconvenienced many of you this morning when you saw the industrial zone out in our parking lot. We have that set up for a youth outreach. We're doing Nerf Wars this afternoon, which is awesome because a lot of students in our community will come together and have a blast and develop relationships with people who have Christ in them, the hope of the world, which is Christ. And and um, this is why we do Operation Christmas Child as well, which I encourage you, come October 6th, but don't come alone. Bring your oikos. Bring somebody in your 8 to 15, somebody who God has supernaturally and strategically placed in your life who may be far from Christ. But you know what? I find this ministry so powerful because people who aren't even Christians love blessing children who don't have the privileges that we do in this part of the planet. Are you with me? So think of somebody and invite them and be a part of that ministry. So I, I want to talk about our bottom line right up front for this new series, Emotionally Healthy. And here's the bottom line. It comes from a fantastic book that I'm going to tell you about. So the bottom line is Christian spirituality without an integration of emotional health can be deadly to yourself, your relationship with God, and the people around you. And this comes from uh, author and, and pastor Peter Schizero's book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And I want to encourage you to pick up this book. If you like to read, if you like to dig a little deeper and to process and to pray through this series as we go through it, I encourage you to pick up uh, this book and go through it. It has been a blessing to me, and it will get you into God's Word and get you into Jesus as well. Now, how do you let go of what is eating you up? emotionally, what is challenging you emotionally, whether it's some kind of circumstance that you went through that you know, kind of bothered you and affected you and you carry with you emotionally, or maybe it's some kind of past trauma and you carry the, that negative circumstance with your life, your family, your marriage, and it just keeps popping up. And you keep going back to it in your mind and in your heart. And as negative as the experience was in the past, you, you love the emotional response to it because you keep it close to you. You hold on to it. And when you hold on to it, you give that emotional pain, that emotional circumstance power over your life. You keep your energy tied to the people, for example, that may have hurt you in the past. And you make that part of your identity. I love this statement. Think about this. You might be addicted to your problems. You might be addicted to your problems and therefore addicted to the emotional response wherever it takes you. And as a Christ follower, that can be a matter of idolatry, of worshiping something that is not God and placing your problems, placing your emotional state on such a high platform in your life where they were never supposed to be. And I believe this sermon series is going to challenge us to be thinking about the little g gods in our life that are warring for our allegiance. And that can be the circumstances that were painful in our past and the emotional state that we're currently in because of what we went through. But only the one true God we read about in Scripture has the sovereign power and authority to satisfy every longing in your heart, even when you don't feel him, even in the midst of your emotional pain. We want to come back to God with all that we are. Now, I recently heard a, a podcast interview 
And it was with a counselor and a counselee. And, and this guy was talking to this woman. She's a uh, grown adult, been married for many, many years, has children of her own. And she was sharing this experience of when she was 14 years old, when she was a freshman in high school, she was raped by four high school senior boys at a party. And so she was unpacking this story on, uh, to this counselor, and she shared how she struggled, obviously, with this, this traumatic experience and, and, and carried it with her for many, many years. And of course, somebody in, in a traumatic experience would, in fact, do that. But what she shared, too, that was so insightful is that she articulated how she continued for years and years and years to live her life identity within that traumatic experience. She identified herself as this victim. And what she said is that she elevated the emotional response to that to a place of power and influence where it always you know, changed her emotions and then that changed her behavior as a result. And, and, and some people can do that. Some people can take horrific experiences or just negative experiences and you know what, we love them and we hold on to them and we carry that anger or that bitterness or that rage, whatever emotional state you're in, with you through your life. And I have done this. Many, many years ago, I was at this church and there, there were these you know, spiritual authorities over me in my life and they stole literally, no joke, tens of thousands of dollars from my family. No attempt at making an apology or restitution. And I have carried frustration and bitterness. Sometimes I wake up and I'm like, why am I even a pastor at a church? Those guys hurt my family. And I carry that with me, and I, and I get it, but sometimes I let my emotions get to such a high platform that it clouds out the reality that Christ overcomes any trial. Christ overcomes any negative emotions, and there is incredible hope and grace for the present and the future in all of our lives. Amen? Do you agree with that? Do you believe that? Amen. So what about you? What negative experience in your past, or maybe your present, that is emotionally riling you up, that the pendulum of emotions in you is swinging actively and intensely. Maybe you were let go from a job and you still remember that. You still feel the pain of that moment when you were told. Or maybe you were never hired in the first place after dozens and dozens of interviews. You kept knocking on doors and the door was shut in your face and you're still struggling with that. Maybe you went through a divorce or some kind of abuse or you just personally made a dumb decision yourself and it hurt people around you. It hurt them bad and you can't take it back and you still struggle emotionally with the pain of that. You carry that pain with you on a daily basis. And yes, you want to you learn from that pain and rise above it and make tomorrow better, but, but it's still, you still drag that emotional pain with you. And what do you do with that? So the counselor in this interview said something profound, and they camped on this concept for a bit, and I think it's true. He said, one of the greatest addictions that we can have is our addiction to our problems, past and present. Our addictions to our problems and to the re emotional response, because we keep playing them over and over and over in our minds, and for whatever reason, we just grow close to them and keep them close to our mind. And those problems justify the lack of actions we take in life or should be taking in life. Now, it's our responsibility to go where God's calling us. But sometimes we say, God, I'm going to play this card, this get out of responsibility card, because I'm still having a hard time with ABC. And that can be our identity and we can keep playing that card over and over and over. And again, I'm not trying to diminish the pain of going through a tough circumstance. You need to deal with it. But to create an identity for the rest of your life within something like that, that's something that we need to think about. You see, that can keep us from taking risks for God because we find our significance in our pain and our emotional response. Instead of finding our significance, and taking risks for God. What's God calling you to do? When was the last time your heart beat so fast, you were so nervous, your palms are sweaty, you're absolutely afraid, if God doesn't come through for this, I, I'm dead in the water. 
when was the last time you were in that place emotionally? Maybe inviting somebody to church, inviting somebody to, to fill Operation Christmas Child shoeboxes or inviting them to your small group. When was the last time you did that? And you were so nervous because you, you don't know how they're going to respond. You don't know the questions they're going to ask or, or maybe they're going to judge you. You have no idea. But when was the last time you took a significant risk for God? Maybe we find our significance too much in our emotional response to things that happen in our life. Now, everyone has problems. If you look around this room, there's a lot of beautiful people in this room, but they all have problems. I'm just telling you. Your neighbor, you're sitting beside a potato sack of problems right there. I'm, I'm telling you. It's, that's just the reality. We all have issues. We all have challenges. We all have problems. And, and a lot of us, um, especially men, can walk around with poker faces like, now we got it. We don't have problems. Uh, how are you feeling today? Fine. Okay. Good. We're all fine, right? You're fine. I'm fine. We're all fine. We're not fine. But listen, some of the people who um, externally uh, look like you manage your emotions well, you're probably the worst. You're probably the worst at managing your emotions. Things are churning inside of you. Especially guys can be prone to put up this external um, stoic poker face persona. But yet, guys, you are emotional and you deal with this stuff and you deal with the crud in your life. And, and then sometimes we, we just let it out in an unhealthy way because we don't know how to deal with it. Bitterness, anger, resentment, confusion. You know, there's so many stories of people responding uh, out of their emotions because they didn't deal with their emotions in a healthy or a godly way. For example, um, I don't know if you heard in the news, something like a couple weeks ago, in Valinda, there was a, a, a murder-suicide. And, and, and there, there was a brother and sister, and they were arguing. And then their emotions just flew off the handle. And, and somebody shot and killed a family member and then killed themselves. I mean, when you turn on the news, what is the news? News is all about negative responses to negative emotions. That's all it is, all the time. And we hear these stories all across our country. See, your emotions should never have the last say. Your emotions shouldn't because that's worshiping them. That's elevating them to a place that they were never created to be. Emotions make bad gods. Emotions make bad gods. If any of this resonates with you, I encourage you to take an incredible step of commitment. Stay with us through this series because it's going to be life transforming from the inside out. And we're going to be guided by God's word and the truth of scripture. And so show up every week. Invite your 8 to 15 because even if they don't believe in Christ, even if they're not Christians, this is going to be helpful stuff that we're going through. If you happen to miss a message or want to share a message with your friends, uh, you can do that. Go to our website, christfirst.org slash media, and you can check out any message there that you want to share. So let's jump into it. Number one, you have sermon outline notes. You can fill uh, in the blanks and follow along. Number one, emotions are real. Emotions are real. We know that, but we need to be reminded of that and the implications of that. Genesis 127, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him what? Male and female, he created them. Emotions are real. God created them. God created the male emotions and the female emotions in his image. Image. Some people might be quick to think talking about emotions in church is not correct. This, this should be reserved for some kind of secular counselor's office because it sounds really uh, humanistic to talk about. Uh, but the Bible would refute that statement. There is so much emotion in the Bible, so much emoting in the Bible. Our God is an emotional God. Did you know that? Our God has emotions, and we're going to look into that. Now, think about this. If you think about your life, I want to show you this picture. It's a picture of an iceberg. And, and, and an iceberg, about 10% of an iceberg is above the water. And I would say your life, about 10% of it, is your external life, how you relate to uh, your parents, your, your spouse, your, your siblings, your children, your friends, your community. That's your external life. There is a lot going beneath 
the surface, right? What's going on beneath the surface in each and every one of you? Well, you have thoughts. Just a quick poll. How many of you think? Okay, not everybody, but um, we all think. And then we all have beliefs about what we think, and our beliefs inform what we think. And then our beliefs are informed about our authority source. If you're a Christ follower, you say, Christ is my authority. That informs my beliefs. That informs my thoughts. Now, you also have emotions that beneath the surface, inside of you, whether you share them with somebody or not, they are there. And you emotionally react and respond to your beliefs and to your thoughts, to your authority source, and to what's happening in and through and to you externally. And so there is a lot going beneath the surface. When you look around at the people who are in this room, oh my goodness, there's an incredible amount of um, activity going on beneath the surface. And, and nobody goes to this deep place with you typically other than yourself and maybe Jesus. But often it's just you. Sometimes, you know, you might invite a spouse or a close friend deep into the recesses of your heart and talk about your deep emotions and, and your thoughts unfiltered and raw, but that's rare. Most of the time, it's you and yourself, and whenever you invite Jesus beneath the surface into that place. Now, God created man in his own image, including your emotions inside you. As men and women, our emotions were created and gifted to us from God, a God, like I said, who emotes. Don't miss next week because we're going to look into how God expresses himself. We're going to look at the emotions of God next week. But for now, just know that emotions are real, that they were created by God. Number two, emotions are real, but not always right. We know this as well, but it's good to be reminded of this. Your emotions are real, but they are not always right. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You all are a bunch of sinners, so am I, including your emotions are tainted with sin. I was at a high school football game a few weeks ago, and there was this guy sitting about six uh, rows up behind me, and this guy was a jerk. He was yelling at the home team. He's wearing home team colors, and he's yelling out at these players, you're a horrible player. You're a sorry excuse for a football player. Get off the field. You're ruining this game for us. Why are you even out there? And he's just this, this poisonous drivel out um, constantly. It drove me crazy. And beside me, there was this guy, and, and, and he had gone over to the concession. At the, at the concession, they sell one of the most amazing, incredible, uh, beautiful, um, powerful gifts of God called funnel cake. <laughs> and he had, he had one of these in his lap, and, and I just I wasn't thinking. I was just ticked off, and I, I borrowed his funnel cake. And I walked up six steps up there, and I went up to this dude, and I'm like, dude, you sound like a whiny, sour 12-year-old. Let me sweeten you up. And I, took, I, went, I put it in his face. He deserved it. Total jerk. Okay, I didn't do that. But I felt like doing that. I totally wanted to smash a funnel cake in his face, embarrass him, and, and, and shut that guy up. I wanted to teach him a lesson. Have you ever felt like wringing someone's neck? Be honest. Put up your hand if you've ever felt like wringing someone's neck. Come on. Thank you. I'm not alone. Have you ever felt like punching someone in the face? Come on. Put your hand up. I got two hands up. Yes. Come on. Have you ever felt like you could push a red button in your car and destroy the car that cut you off on the freeway? <laughs> not, not hurt anybody. Just teach them a lesson. Right? Push that red button. Have you ever felt like you wanted to embarrass somebody so bad and, and just gossip about them and teach them a lesson? That's it. I'm, I'm letting the, the cat out of the bag. That's it. I'm sharing with everybody. Have you ever gone home from just a tough day at work and you're like, I need to eat a bucket of ice cream? Have you ever felt like eating a whole bucket of ice cream? Like, like chocolate fudge moose tracks ice cream. I highly recommend it. It's great. It's Stater Brothers brand was fantastic. I, I didn't eat the whole thing, but I sure felt like it. 
See, your emotions will make you feel like doing something that is wrong and doesn't line up with your beliefs. Did you know that? Yes, you know that. There's often a gap between what you believe is true and what you feel emotionally. Emotions are true, but they are not truth. Let me say that again. Emotions are true, but they are not truth. Only God's word is truth. Can I get an amen? Only God's word is truth. Sanctify them in the truth, Jesus said. Your word is truth. If so many people have this conversation with me, I'm learning this too about my own emotions. They say, oh, but I feel this and I can't do this. I'm like, well, it's just a feeling. It'll pass. Get over it. (laughs) But I I probably should emote with them a little bit before I get to that place so quick. But the reality is that your emotions aren't true. Uh, truth. They are true, but they are not truth. The lie that you buy into is that your emotions are truth. That's the lie that I buy into. The gift of God, though, is that you don't have to buy into your initial emotional reaction to anything. Praise God for that. That's a gift from God. He gives you that gap, that opportunity. God has gifted you with metacognition. You can think about your thoughts as you think about your emotions. You have the ability to conceptualize that and to think about, okay, here's what I feel like doing. Maybe I shouldn't do that. I'm going to squash that. Filter's going to kick in. See, Proverbs 14, 12, it says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but, it is, but its end is the way to death. And sometimes, literally, your emotions want to destroy you, and they will take you down that path to destruction. I want to invite you to turn to Luke chapter 18. Uh, Luke chapter 18, if you have a a Bible, if you don't, if you have a smartphone, download a Bible app and scroll to Luke chapter 18. Um, So we get that our emotions are not always right, but that they are true. Your emotions exist. You are an emotional person. And they are real. They have a tendency to influence your decisions and my decisions. So if you feel like punching someone in the face or or, or putting a funnel cake in their face, what do you do with those feelings when they bubble up inside you passionately? A gift of God is the gap between your emotions and your actions. Did your mama ever tell you, count to 10 before you react? Did she ever tell you that? Thomas Jefferson, uh, he, he, was, he, he was quoted as saying, if you're angry, count to 10 before you react. If you're very angry, count to 100. <laughs> Take time and invite Jesus into that space between what you feel and how you want to react. So let's look at Luke uh, chapter 18. We've got a couple characters going on in this passage. We have a Pharisee, a religious leader at that time. Um, They were not seen in a positive light. Uh, They were legalistic. They looked down on people, as you're going to see. And then we have a tax collector. Tax collectors were the bottom of the barrel morally in the Jewish culture. In Scripture, you will often see this phrase, there were sinners and tax collectors. Tax collectors has their own category of being a sinner. They were so horrible and so repulsive. People hated them because tax collectors were Jewish people extorting money from their own people to give to the Roman uh, emperor. So that's the two characters going on here. Let's look at uh, chapter 18 of Luke, starting in verse 10. It says, two men uh, went up into the temple to pray. So they're in Jerusalem. They're going up to the temple, which is a place to meet with God, to to bring sacrifices to God, to honor, to worship God. It's kind of like going to to church. And why did they go up there? What does it say? Why? To to what? To, To talk to God. To talk to God. I love that. Why do you come to church? Do you come to church for the good music, to to meet some people? Do you come to church to uh, get some good snacks, uh, to hear some stories? Why do you come to church? I hope your number one reason you come to church is to meet with God. Amen? That's always got to be our number one reason to come to church. So two men went up into the temple to pray. Wonderful. That's fantastic. One's a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now the Pharisee standing by himself prayed. He prayed this, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, what was he doing? He's standing far off from this Pharisee. He would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, 
Be merciful to me, a, a sinner. And Jesus says, he comments on this story. He says, I tell you, this man, this tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So number three in your outline is humbly invite Jesus to heal your interior life. This is going to take work. This is going to take hard work. And Jesus says, you have a part to play in humbling yourself. Now, you all think, put up your hand if you've ever had moments where you're just a lazy thinker. <laughs> Appreciate the honesty. We all have a tendency to be lazy thinkers. We can be lazy with our actions, but we can also be lazy with our thoughts. I want to challenge you in this series to not be lazy thinkers, to really think about what God's teaching you, to think about what you're thinking about, and to think about your emotional state as well. And that's how you can humbly invite Jesus to heal your interior life. Again, but the tax collector standing far off, he would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. He, he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, this tax collector, he stood far off, as in, I am so disgusted with this guy. He's treating me like garbage, and I kind of probably feel like garbage as a tax collector. And I'm at this place. I'm at church. I'm with these religious leaders, and, and his emotions are real. He, he's probably mad, ashamed, and he feels like, like garbage. And, and this is how he responds in verse 13. He doesn't lift up his eyes. Now, at the temple, Jewish people would pray to God, looking up with their arms outstretched, palms up as they prayed to God, but not this tax collector. Why? He was humble. He was maybe disgusted with himself. He was just feeling like, I'm not worthy. I'm not going to come to God like that. Why would God accept me? And it says he's beating his breast. What does that mean? Well, in scripture, this is an action of grief. He is sad. He's, he's just feeling horrible about what kind of person, what kind of lifestyle he's living, how he does not measure up to this religious leader, to this Pharisee. And what does he do? He audibly prays to God. And what does he say? He says, God, just be merciful to me. A what? A sinner. A sinner. He just throws the truth out there. And God knows what he's done. God knows what you have done. And I want to encourage you in your relationship with your perfect heavenly father, be real, be raw, tell Jesus exactly what you feel, articulate it. Don't be a lazy thinker when you're talking to God, but be articulate, share what you're feeling, get it off your chest or like this guy, beat it off your chest and just give it to God. It's better to be doing this than punching somebody in the face, I'm telling you. Jesus has big enough shoulders to handle your raw and real emotions. When was the last time you got so upset and you're, you're, you're cussing and you're talking to God while you're doing it? He can handle that. I bet you feel like cussing sometimes. I do. So why do you hold back on that realness with God and invite him into that emotion? God has big enough shoulders to handle your complaints at that level. In fact, in fact, at that real and raw level where you're encountering God, that's the type of person Jesus can work with. Someone being completely honest and humble with God about their emotional state and articulating it and saying it out loud. See, if you don't, if you pretend you don't have garbage in your heart when you talk to Jesus, basically you're saying, Jesus, I'm perfect. I'm perfect. I don't need you. I can handle this crud all by myself. And you're propping yourself up to be a God. And God's a jealous God, and he won't compete with anybody who thinks they can do a better job than him. And all of a sudden, you're kind of like a Pharisee. Be real and raw. Don't pretend you're perfect because that's exactly where the devil wants you to be. He wants you to ignore those emotions so that you don't think about your emotions, you just emote. 
and let them take you wherever they take you. So don't be lazy. Don't be afraid of your shame and embarrassment to audibly express what's on your heart and desperately ask Jesus for mercy and do it out loud. I do this often in my car when nobody's around. It's a great place to do it. Don't do it with your eyes closed if you're in your car behind the wheel. But this interior hard work is here for a lifetime. How many of you in this room, you're over 55 years old, and you still kind of struggle sometimes with emotions? Put up your hand. So this emotional challenge doesn't get easier? You guys don't have it solved? No, it's going to be with us for the rest of our lives. But invite Jesus into it. And understand that you're not the only one struggling with whatever emotions you're carrying right now. You're not alone. The devil wants to tell you that you're alone. Don't believe that for a second. Communicate all your emotions directly to the one who is available and always available to help you. Communicate that to God. Why is he always the last one to know? Inside point, he already knows, <laughs> so you're not surprising him with anything. But why is it that you don't bring that stuff to him on a regular basis? So I want to give you some practical steps as we uh, come out of the starting blocks with this series. We're going to be coming back to these steps, encouraging these steps, encouraging you in them. Practical steps to emotional honesty with Jesus. Number one, tell Jesus out loud specifically what you are feeling and what you feel like doing. Do that more often when you're praying to God. Don't pretend. Tell him what you're feeling. Let him have it with all your emotions. He can handle it. But don't let your emotions be the final say in your time with the Lord. See, this is first stating what is true. Your, your emotions are true. But then number two, you need to also state the truth. And that's evaluating whether your true emotions line up with God's truth. That's why it's good to memorize this, remember this, get to church, hear God's word, read God's word, let the truth of God flow through your heart and through your mind, and then state the truth out loud. I love that the tax collector did that. He said, God, have mercy on me. As in, you know what? God can have mercy on you. Sometimes you need to be reminded of that by saying it audibly out loud. And then I want to encourage you to write this stuff down. Write it down in a journal. Start journaling if you don't. Write it down because you're more specific. Uh, it helps you to think more. It helps you to not be lazy with your thoughts when you spend a moment and just write down your thoughts in a journal. I personally use an app called Day One. It's, a, it's an awesome journal. And uh, I've been using it for many years. It, it, the interface is beautiful and, and it's fun to use. Um, and it re reminds you, hey, it, it says, hey, this day in the, in the last few years, this is what you were journaling. And it, it brings that up. It's really cool. So I can get an, an emotional insight to where I was a year or two ago. So write this stuff down and then do it every day. Do it every day. Do it every day. Don't make excuses. You brush your teeth every day. You can spend time with God every day. You can make excuses or progress. You can't make both. Do it every, every day. And you're going to find yourself to become more Christ-centric driven instead of emotionally driven. And imagine your allegiance to your problems and to the emotions surrounding these problems become less in your life and you're more about Christ and taking risks for Christ because that's where you find your significance. I pray the Lord would give you courage to diligently humble yourself over the next few weeks to spend more time with the Lord and to spend more real and raw times with the Lord so that you repent of your idolatry of placing emotions too high in your life and get Christ back on the throne and get your emotions aligned and your thoughts aligned with Christ. So next week, um, we're going to go deep in your go-to emotions. We're going to talk about a spectrum of emotions uh, in your life. That We're going to see that in scriptures next week. We're going to look at the emotions um, that God emotes in scripture. It's going to be fascinating. And, and we're also going to look at the temptations that Satan works within your emotions as well. And he plays off them. I tell you, he plays off them. And my prayer is that next week that you're going to learn how to uh, fully uh, feel 
I pray that you will feel free to fully feel next week. You don't want to miss it. Again, invite somebody because everybody deals with emotional crud in their lives. Even if they don't believe in Christ, this is going to be very practical for them. Tell them to come and learn about yourself and learn about your emotions. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is life-changing. And thank you for the gift of emotions, God. And sometimes they're all over the place, all over the map. Some of us right now, God, we're just carrying low-grade anger, bitterness, frustration, whatever it is, God. And I pray that uh, they would invite you into those emotions, that they would take time and not be uh, uh, lazy with their thoughts, but really think about their thoughts and think about their emotions. God, give us your diligence. Give us your spirit of power, love, and self-control as we grow in this inward life of ours. And we invite Jesus into it. God, I pray for those who who don't have a relationship with Christ, if, if they want the God of the universe who created them and knit them together in their mother's womb to, to help them walk through this, they, they can come to God and be a child of God as simple as ABCA, admit that you're a sinner. B, believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And C, choose to follow Christ. Choose to make Christ your authority, your leader, your Lord, not your emotions. And bring the joy that can only be found in Christ to the world. Lord, we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.